Welcome and aloha. My name is Mark Schwab. I am the host of Think Tech Hawaii's Law Across the Sea program. Today we will go across the sea to discuss lawsuits that were recently filed in the United States against China defendants for the COVID-19 pandemic. And our guest, Rob Preck, is a lawyer and founder and president of Justice Labs. Welcome, Rob. How are you? Thank you, Mark. Uh, thanks very much for having me. I'm well. Okay. Now, Rob, tell me first a little bit about your background, uh, your relationship with China, uh, what you did there, and uh, you know how long you were in China. Okay. Well, very briefly, I uh, the first part of my career, I was a public defender in New York City, both as a trial and an appellate lawyer. Then I moved uh, to the University of Michigan Law School, and I was there for about eight years or so. As a professor? And, uh, actually, I was running a, a public interest program, uh, I see. and I was a, a head of the pro bono program and career advising and things of that sort. So uh, that was a great experience. But then I... Uh, uh, long story short, I was asked to start uh, a human rights project on behalf of a New York nonprofit in Beijing, and I did that. I went there, uh, and I was lived in Beijing for uh, five years, from 2008 to 2013, and it was basically a legal education program designed for Chinese law students and Chinese lawyers. Uh, about Western notions of public interest law, how lawyers can use law to uh, protect people or to vindicate rights and things of that sort, and to launch lawsuits against governments. As you can imagine, it wasn't a particularly popular message uh, among some of the authorities in Beijing, and we would not be able to do that today, but in, in that period, there was a brief window. And since uh, about 2014, I've been uh, uh, directing Justice Labs. Justice Labs is a 501c3 corporation. It's a blend of being a think tank focusing on public interest issues and a resource to students and lawyers who want to pursue public interest careers. And uh, that's been a lot of fun. Wow, so you have had a lot of time in, in China. In in Beijing, and now we're seeing uh, a bunch of cases come up, and I'd like yes. you to focus um, on these lawsuits. These these recent lawsuits in the United States have been filed in the United States against China or China defendants about the COVID nineteen pandemic. I mean, what are these lawsuits about, and you know, what's the basis of these lawsuits? Well, in the in the in the biggest picture, the basis of the lawsuits is that. Uh, people and businesses in the U.S. feel aggrieved. They feel a great damage has been done to them. And so thus far, there has been no mechanism put forth uh, by politicians or anyone else to help these people get redress, to have their day in court, so to speak. I mean, that's an expression in English, to have your day in court. And so on the broadest level, it's an attempt for people to have their day in court. And there are different variations of these lawsuits. In the case of Missouri, it's the attorney general who has uh, uh, filed a lawsuit in uh, federal district court as a representative of all of the Missourians who have been injured, who have faced economic harm or uh, wrongful deaths as a result of this. Um, in other uh, states, and Nevada, Florida, California, uh, the, there are suits that are in the form of, 
of class actions on the basis of, you know, I think in the Florida uh, uh, case, uh, the, the class that the, the lawyers are seeking to certify are small businesses and individuals, likewise in California. So, um, so they're all um, brought in federal court and they're based on state law. I mean, the, the attorney general in Missouri, and I've, I've looked at that document, it's fairly well drafted, is uh, basing his argument uh, on violations of Missouri law regarding being a public nuisance or mishandling uh, dangerous activities or breach of duty, those common law tort principles. And you mentioned like, there, you sound like there's like four states that you mentioned uh, and the people that are aggrieved are Americans, I guess. And, and the plaintiffs, uh, could you clarify that? I mean, are the plaintiffs, are they, is this, are the plaintiffs government uh, entities, or attorney general, or who, who are, what's the name of the plaintiffs in these cases? Right, well, in the case of the Missouri um, action, it, the, the plaintiff is the Attorney General of Missouri as representative of the people of, of, of Missouri. Okay. And, and um, I, this morning I was taking a quick look at some of the class actions and there are named individuals and businesses who are the plaintiffs in the class actions. All U.S. entities? Yes, to my people. knowledge they are all U.S. people or entities, yes. Okay, now... All right, so you have several states. It sounds like uh, government entities of some sort, and they're all brought in federal case, for federal court. Is that right? That's my understanding. So, yes. So, yeah, and but but they may be seeking remedies under state law, which okay, all right. And uh, who are the defendants in the? In these well, the defendants states? vary. I mean, if you look at uh, the, um, I'm looking now at the Missouri action. Um, uh, the, the defend, I could read off a list. It, the, the defendants are the People's Republic of China, the Communist Party of China, National Health Commission of the People's Republic of China, Ministry of Emergency Management of the People's Republic of China, Ministry of Civil Affairs of the People's Republic of China, uh, People's Government of Hubei Province, People's Government of Wuhan City, Wuhan Institute of Virology and the Chinese Academy of Science of Sciences, and that's that's the the Missouri action. I, I noticed that the class actions are also including the the People's Liberation Army. So I don't know how that all fits in. But, <laughs> wow! And, yeah. and so it looks like there's kind of a division in the defendants uh, between governmental entities and maybe um, I'm not sure if they're private entities, but um, not not non-governmental entities uh, of some sort. Is that would that be accurate? To I'm sorry that, that there's a kind of a division between in the defendants between governmental entities and maybe semi-governmental. Yeah. Entities? Well, you know that's a good question, but it's so hard to even distinguish that in um, China because many, if if most of the many businesses are controlled by the government. So mm -hmm. I would say, I would characterize it as, yes, a, an action against the authorities in Beijing plus their agents. Okay, and you said that Missouri is not a class action, or is it? No. That, that's my understanding. It's brought in the name of uh, um, the state of Missouri, uh, Eric, S. Schmidt in his official capacity of Missouri Attorney General. But the rest are cla sounds like yes. class actions. And, and you know, they, the, the, the class actions uh, uh, present their own challenges that are slightly different from uh, the challenges that the uh, Missouri State Attorney General okay. has. But yes. Explain that a little bit, please. What's, well, what's, I mean, what's the difference? Uh, I mean, there are a number of procedural hurdles as, as, as uh, which we can talk about, including you know, jurisdiction and the standing of uh, people to sue. Um, but in the, and, and, and the, those issues are dealt with by the Missouri Attorney General. The added issue in terms of the uh, other state class actions is 
how do you get the class certified? In other words, there's an initial problem in terms of describing uh, the class of individuals who are aggrieved because everyone has kind of suffered their own kind of injury. And mm -hmm. uh, it may simply, I think there's a requirement in class actions, I'm not an expert in that field, that the uh, class be manageable, that it be, that it's easily identifiable, that they face the same kind of harms and things of that sort. And so the lawyers for the class action suits will have to convince the court that the, uh, that the people that they are uh, representing or want to create a class out of, that it's a manageable group. I'm not saying that's impossible, but it's an additional challenge. Okay, so can you describe what the allegations and claims are being made can you I mean is it sure. can you possible I'll, I'll, to generalize I, yeah let me, let me i think i can best do it in a nutshell uh by reading just very briefly uh, one paragraph from the uh missouri attorney general um, um missourians from the covid 19 pandemic uh that has disrupted the entire world an appalling campaign of deceit, concealment, misfeasance, and inaction by Chinese authorities unleashed this pandemic. During the critical weeks of the initial outbreak, Chinese authorities deceived the public, suppressed crucial information, arrested whistleblowers, denied human-to-human -human transmission in the face of mounting evidence, destroyed critical medical research, permitted millions of people to be exposed to the virus, and even hoarded personal protective equipment, thus causing a global pandemic that was unnecessary and preventable. Defendants are responsible for the enormous death, suffering, and economic losses they inflicted on the world, including Missourians, and they should be held accountable. That's it. Wow, okay. Uh, and and uh, I guess uh, the class actions might have similar- It's a similar type. language, yes. Yeah, and- uh, <laughs> Are, are they citing any law or is this, I mean, is, is there a, a legal basis or what, what are they, what law are we operating under? I mean, is this Chinese or American or? Yeah, law? it's, it's a, what, it's a murky the, the legal basis. I mean, those are all excellent questions. It's, it's a murky area. And I think actually the, this, this litigation is going to result in some new doctrines or, or new precedences being created. But right now, uh, they are filed in federal district court and they're based on ordinary tort claims, you know. American uh, negligence. Yes, American negligence, recklessness, uh, damage to property, breach of duty, wrongful death. Um, and uh, there, are, in terms of my current knowledge, I'm not aware of any international conventions that directly apply. But um, that's uh, it's it's firmly based on common okay. law. Let's put it that way. Common law, okay. And do they in these complaints do they cite any specific evidence or are these just general allegations? Well, no. They make uh, uh, in the Missouri indict uh, the Missouri action uh, lists a whole sort assortment of pieces of evidence gleaned from newspapers and media outlets and things of that sort. So there are allegations of the specific acts that occurred in Wuhan that they say caused the pandemic. I mean, that, that's, that's uh, untrue. Pointed appendage found at the end of it. So um, that's, there are allegations, specific allegations, yes. Okay, and they cite evidence and I guess the evidence you, you know, you, you, you discussed a number of different defendants and uh, they, are they saying the evidence is applicable to all of them or did they have any specific? Well, I think that the, against specific defendants. Well, I think the claim is that the, the Communist Party directed or supervised all of the other defendants and then the actions fa focus on the actions of um, the particular other defendants. For instance, the Wuhan 
lab, um, there's an allegation that there was, there were safety lapses in that lab uh, and that those were ignored. And so uh, that's part of the uh, lawsuit as well, that there were uh, complaints in the lab, that there were complaints about what the mayor of Wuhan did in terms of allowing large meetings to take place even after it was apparent that, that the city was in a ep epidemic situation. So there are specific allegations that come from mostly news accounts. Okay, uh, uh, we're gonna take a break. Yes. We'll come right back and talk about uh, some of the roadblocks okay. that these lawsuits may face. So we'll take a one minute break, we'll be right back. Aloha, I'm John David Ann, the host of History Lens on Think Tech Hawaii. History Lens deals with contemporary events and looks at them through a historical perspective or what we call a history lens. Uh, the show is streamed live on thinktechhawaii.com. Thanks so much for watching our show. We look forward to seeing you then. Mahalo and aloha. We are right back with Rob Preck. We are talking about the recent COVID-19 pandemic lawsuits that have been filed in the United States against China defendants, various defendants. And Rob, um, what are some of the practical problems that we're facing with these lawsuits? I mean, I mean, how, how, I mean service, jurisdiction, Please, you know, what, what, right. what, are the, what are the plaintiffs facing from a practical standpoint? And first, I mean, you know, how, how do you serve these people? Uh, and then, then we'll get into jurisdiction and, and, you know, whether we can even go after some of these. Right. Well, on the question of service, that's a, a relatively simple matter because uh, that's specified in the statute uh, dealing with uh, um, uh, foreign sovereign immunity. There is a separate statute that we'll talk about that uh, authorizes lawsuits in the case of certain exceptions to the general rule. Oh, okay. Um, but service, ultimately, if, say, the state or uh, lawyers can't find someone in the U.S. representing the Chinese government to accept service of papers, ultimately, um, they can send copies to the U.S. State Department of their complaint, um, and the State Department will convey it to their council, uh, their diplomatic uh, offices in China, and then the diplomatic offices will transmit the uh, legal papers to the appropriate ministry. I think this would be the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. So services is. is does not strike me as a big problem. I mean, there are a couple of problems that have been raised by a number of American lawyers uh, as being very big bars to these lawsuits. Um, the first, of course, is this, uh, the doctrine of sovereign immunity. Yeah, what's uh, the that? idea? Right, the idea is that uh, uh, private citizens cannot sue the federal government, and then by virtue of this statute called uh, the uh, Foreign uh, Sovereign Immunity Act, um, the argument is that the act prevents citizens from suing uh, governments. Um, but uh, the thing to remember about sovereign immunity is that sovereign immunity is not an inherent limitation on judicial power. It is nowhere stated in the Constitution. It's really a creation of uh, congressional laws, and the current foreign sovereign immunity statute, although it allows for limited exceptions against the 
general rule that private citizens cannot uh, sue foreign governments. Um, there are important exceptions to that. Uh, and one of them, for example, was recently the law was amended to permit uh, uh, lawsuits against uh, foreign governments for acts of terrorism or for uh, mm. facilitating acts of terrorism. So uh, as it currently reads, um, obviously, and based on the evidence, uh, what the lawyers are alleging, I, I mean, one lawyer uh, in Florida is alleging that this is tantamount to a terrorist uh, mm. act. Interesting. Right? allowing the escape of these deadly viruses from Wuhan. Uh, but I think that's a pretty far-fetched argument. Um, the other lawsuits, the Missouri lawsuit is relying on uh, uh, certain exceptions uh, regarding if a government acts as a business entity, then it should not be exempt from liability. In other words, if right. the, the, a foreign government had a a factory across the border from the U.S. and owned that factory, and the factory uh, spewed forth pollution that uh, killed livestock in Texas or something like that, then the uh, foreign immunity statute would not bar uh, lawsuits. Now, given the current state of the law, I think it's going to be a tough sell for the Missouri Attorney General and others to claim that this case against China uh, falls within either the exception for business activities or the exception for terrorist acts. But having said that, this law can easily be amended. Uh, a new exception could be created, for example, the public health exception. And uh, Congress, and, and indeed there are several bills before Congress that would amend this act uh, so as to allow law lawsuits in cases where governments recklessly uh, engage in acts that uh, produce public health uh, crises. And I, so I think that it's very likely, given the political climate right now, that the foreign immunity statutes will be amended and that the lawsuits can go forward uh, on jurisdiction grounds. And are, are these amendments in Congress, I mean, are they a result of the COVID-19 yes, pandemic? Yes, oh, yes. Okay. my understanding is yes. They have been introduced since March and April. And I think specifically as a result of the uh, uh, pandemic. Um, uh, but putting aside the, the uh, jurisdictional question, um, let's assume that people are allowed through the courtroom door. Uh, let's assume just for a moment that either courts or Congress allows uh, citizens or states to bring actions against China for recklessly endangering the health of Americans. Uh, there's still this big, big problem of proof, causation. Um, and the problem is, is that, look, you can allege all the bad acts you might want to in terms of what happened to China. And, you know, it includes, uh, uh, you know, uh, not adhering to international guidelines for health, uh, lax safeguards at the lab, uh, suppressing evidence of the spread of the virus, not telling the WHO that there was human to human transition, all these things. You can list them, but just the fact that China engaged in these uh, actions doesn't mean that those actions caused the damage in America. In other words, there's no proof whatsoever at this point that had the Chinese government had behaved completely differently, had it had great safeguards in the Wuhan lab, had it promptly told the world about this pandemic, there's no proof that it would have made any difference. Now, there may be such proof, but the documents that I've looked at, the Missouri complaint and the class actions, don't show a causal connection between the Chinese actions and the damages done here. We're asked to assume that based on the bad acts of China, that that resulted in these damages to the world, but 
it can't be assumed that the causal connection has to be shown. And I hear you also saying that there's negligence, and then after the negligence, they they didn't do enough, uh, which is kind of a failure uh, to act. But it was is there any allegation that they intentionally caused this? Well, that's really far fetched. Yes, there are allegations. There are some people in America who believe that. And in the complaints, in the complaints. Uh, no, there... no. Well, well, the closest uh, we come to that is in the Florida complaint, and where. Uh, the lawyers are arguing that uh, what China did was a kind of terrorist act. So yes, the, uh, the, so I mean that requires a very high level of proof, not just negligence, but uh, reckless disregard for the dangers and things of that sort. But even at the low level of proof, just showing negligence is going to be difficult because all the scientific uh, studies I've seen show that the virus can be transmitted by asymptomatic carriers, right? That it's extremely right. transmissible. Mm -hmm. So I think the problems of proof at trial are going to be a greater hurdle uh, for relief than uh, the sovereign immunity doctrine. Okay, let, let's talk in a few minutes we have left, just generally, how, how, is, how have these lawsuits affected the U.S.-China relationship and have you heard reaction from China and has there been any retaliation or, I mean, what, 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 where are we going just generally, you know, you file a lawsuit against somebody there, you get a reaction maybe. and what, what have you seen and what, what does it look right. like? Well, as you might um, predict, the Chinese government, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs uh, did a press conference and dismissed this, these lawsuits. Uh, they called it quote, very absurd. Uh, that there were no no factual basis, and uh, the the foreign ministry implored the U.S. government. The U.S. government should dismiss these vexatious litigations. So the Chinese reaction has not uh, been positive. Uh, one thing I should say is that uh, what's kind of feeding these lawsuits is China's refusal so far to submit to an independent investigation about the origins and the spread okay. of the virus. I think the government, the Chinese government could take the wind out of the sails of these lawsuits if it had agreed to some kind of international tribunal. And there is precedent for that. You know, there was, for example, there was a Canadian factory uh, in the 1920s uh, that produced a pollution that hurt uh, farmers in the state of Washington. And the government of Canada and the government of the U.S. set up an arbitration tribunal to analyze the scientific evidence and to uh, uh, put forth appropriate reparations. So I think China could go a long way to uh, um, neutralizing demand for people to have their day in court in the U.S. if they agreed to an investigation. But so far, they have not. So take a little responsibility for what happened, uh, be in front of it. Yes. That might be a way to maybe resolve, uh, maybe to mediate uh, the problem and maybe avoid some of these lawsuits and a, a way, you know, to achieve the goal. And, and by the way, what, what are they asking for what are, in these lawsuits? What, what, are we, what are they seeking? Damages, I guess? And, yes. Uh, you know, yeah. and, any, uh, basically, they're very open-ended. They're asking for any damages permitted by law for uh, the destruction of the economy of uh, the various states and the deaths of people and the uh, um, undermining of businesses. I mean, so we're talking trillions of dollars if it ever reached that point. And uh, is the motivation strictly money in this? Is there any no, indication I, well, that there's something more? No, I do think there's a genuine sense of people being feeling aggrieved. They don't have work. They can't feed their kids. Uh, they, the deaths of loved ones. So no, it's this very human instinct to want justice for wrongs that have been inflicted on you by the reckless activities of another person or entity.
So there is a call for justice here. Okay, now we have a minute left. Where are these cases going? Where, where do you see these lawsuits ending up or amending or what, what's, where, where do we go forward? Are there gonna be more lawsuits? Yes, I would expect that there will be more and more lawsuits. I mean, uh, um, the, uh, the number of people harmed is potentially immense. And so I expect uh, states and law firms to bring these lawsuits and, and they're gonna multiply. I would expect in the short term that uh, Congress will, or at least I think it's plausible in the short term, that Congress will amend the Foreign Immunities Act to permit lawsuits based on the reckless conduct of governments that result in damages to American citizens. Uh, I expect that to happen you know, in the next month or two. And after that happens, then potentially the lawsuits will agree on a kind of a common strategy or rationale and, and they'll go forward. That said, though I think the lawsuits still face a very steep challenge in terms of how do you prove causation? Whatever the Chinese did that was bad, how did those acts directly result or even indirectly resulted on deaths in America? It's a very uh, difficult causation argument to make. And thus far, I haven't seen anyone able to do that, perhaps experts in the future, we'll be able to identify how it transmitted to the U.S. and uh, can establish causation. But right now, I don't see it. Well, Rob, uh, that sounds like the subject of another program. And uh, we'll be uh, hopefully looking forward to talking to you again about that. And thank you very much. Uh, I appreciate your knowledge and expertise and insights. And uh, these cases are very interesting. And I think uh, as you and I may agree, we could have a, a law school class uh, that would go for a year right. just talking about these cases. Right. right. But uh, thank you very much. Thank and you. Aloha. Thanks very much for having me.